Okay, it is 12.30 and we are going to start our next presentation. And would you mind uh, giving Katie her uh, lead in? Sure. Um, so our next spe speaker is Katie. Uh, Katie recently received her PhD at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science in Ecological Systems. Her background is in genetics, ecology, and aquaculture. And specifically, Katie's research focused on characterizing the genetic impact of local scale hatchery based oyster restoration in the Chesapeake Bay using a combination of experimental field and modeling approaches. And she's currently a Knauss Fellow in the Office of Habitat Conservation, a Deep Water Horizon Restoration Program. Okay, thank you very much. And um... Thanks everyone for tuning in today. Um, I am going to talk to you about a small portion of my dissertation work, which involves investigating the genetic impact of a large scale hatchery based restoration program in the Chesapeake Bay. And so um, worldwide oyster populations have declined and according to Beck et al, um, oyster reefs are among the world's most endangered marine habitats with an estimated 85% decline worldwide. And so in particular, in the Maryland waters of the Chesapeake Bay, the Eastern oyster, Chrysostria virginica, has declined to approximately 1% of historic abundances due to overfishing, habitat destruction, disease, and pollution impacts. And so within the Chesapeake Bay, Maryland, various restoration and management actions have been undertaken to restore the fishery and ecosystem services provided by healthy oyster reefs. And so in addition to providing substrate, so this allows for oyster larvae, so baby oysters to settle on and grow up. Um, since 2010, additional efforts have involved deploying um, juveniles or spat on shell into depleted oyster habitat. And so a federal mandate to restore 20 tributaries by 2025 has provided support for large scale hatchery based restoration within this Chop Tank River region area. And the first of the sub tributary sanctuaries, Harris Creek, um, was completed in 2015. And so the Horn Point Laboratory Oyster Hatchery located on Maryland's Eastern Shore has been responsible for the hatchery culture and deployment of juvenile oysters into tributaries. And so the hatchery produces cultured spat on shell, so juveniles, using local wild rotated broodstock. And so broodstock are these parents that are used to produce oysters for restoration. And so since 2011, billions of spat on shell have been planted in the Harris Creek Sanctuary. And so while hatchery produced oysters can lead to increases in abundances, um, the literature has shown that genetic impacts can hinder successes over the long term. Um, so in particular, hatchery programs that use a reduced number of broodstock, so a small number of broodstock, can lead to reductions in genetic diversity and affected population size. And so genetic diversity is closely tied to a population's adaptive capacity and resilience to environmental change. And um, the affected population size is a an important parameter in conservation biology that um, describes the theoretical or expected rate at which genetic diversity is lost. And so it's this evolutionary analog to census size, and so bigger is better. And so while there are certain um, practices within the hatchery that can alleviate some of the potential risks, um, sometimes following these recommendations can be hampered by the status of the wild population, limited resources or capacity of the program. Um, and in addition, species life history and biology may pose threats to genetic diversity that are not easily controlled. 
And so this was something that we found in a genetic analysis of hatchery produced oysters. And so what was found is that there were reductions in genetic diversity of hatchery produced oysters using two different spawning frameworks um, due to high variance in reproductive success. And um, this is really just one piece of the puzzle that we need to understand about this hatchery based restoration program. And so another really important genetic consideration is the choice of broodstock material. And so uh, many populations are locally adapted. And so this just means that these populations of organisms have evolved traits that give them a higher fitness in their natural environment. So higher fitness meaning probability to survive and reproduce. And so, for example, if a hatchery program uses non-local broodstock in populations that are locally adapted, they can create individuals that have lower fitness in the wild compared to those that were produced by local origin broodstock. And so um, the best practices of restoration guidelines advocate the use of local wild broodstock and to use genetic studies as a guide for determining uh, genetic structure, as well as local adaptation among populations. Um, and interestingly, with the um, uh, increases in high resolution genomic tools, um, recent studies have uncovered uh, higher population structure and local adaptation in marine invertebrates at smaller scales than was previously hypothesized. And so that brings me to my research questions that I'm going to present today. Um, the first is, how does genetic diversity at restored reefs in Harris Creek compare to other populations in the Bay that have not experienced large-scale hatchery-based restoration? And the second is, can we connect hatchery practice to diversity in the field? So diversity at restored reefs in Harris Creek. And then third, um, what is the influence of spatial and environmental variation on observed patterns of genetic differentiation? So is there evidence of local adaptation in these populations? And so I collected a number of, of oyster populations from uh, wild or non-supplemented reefs in Maryland and Virginia, um, including a coastal bay population. And then on the right, you can see um, those are my sampling sites within Harris Creek. And so I sampled reefs that had variable planting efforts. So one planting, two planting, and four plantings, meaning the number of seasons the hatchery planted those reefs with hatchery produced oysters, um, as well as a putative wild sample and a recently recruited spat sample. Um, and just to note, these polygons represent restored cells. And so this just gives you uh, the idea of the scale of this restoration project. And so in terms of the molecular methods that I used, I used a reduced representation library method. And so essentially this reduces the genome of individuals into fragments and allows you to get thousands of these single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. So these are molecular markers that, that we can use for these types of studies. And so um, in particular, this method is beneficial because it allows for high coverage around the areas that you're, of the genome that you're sampling as shown in this figure. And so um, luckily I have a genome to work with, um, which has, is really useful and it's facilitated my work as well as the work for others. And so in doing this analysis, I was able to derive about 7,000, uh, SNPs or markers, um, spaced throughout the genome and 478 individuals. And so, um, with this data, I calculated effective population size um, using specifically a linkage disequilibrium method. And I compared those estimates of these restored reefs to those wild reefs that have not experienced hatchery supplementation. Um, and the first thing that you'll notice is that these estimates are quite comparable. Um, the confidence intervals that I'm showing you are the jackknifing confidence intervals, and there is quite a bit of overlap between the two. Um, but the thing that I noticed is that there was this predictable pattern between planting frequency and effective population size. And so I decided to explore this relationship more using linear models. And so here 
I am showing you the impact of planting season on genetic diversity metrics, um, specifically effective population size and relatedness. And so um, with relatedness, higher relatedness, less genetic diversity. And so um, what you can see is that there are these striking and significant relationships. And so more planting, more hatchery plantings, more genetic diversity at these restored reefs. So great. Um, the next thing I decided to look at is the hatchery keeps really good data on the number of broodstock used each year to produce spot on shell for different reefs in Harris Creek. So I was able to use that information to look at the relationships between that and diversity at restored reefs in Harris Creek. And so here again, I'm showing you the effective population size and relatedness. And what you can see are these really striking, significant, and predictable relationships. And so increased number of broodstock, increased genetic diversity. Um, and these are relationships that are expected, um, but this is the first time that they have been shown empirically with such strong and predictable relationships. And so that is quite exciting. Um, and so back to these effective population size estimates um, and putting these numbers into context. Um, how are these populations in the Bay doing? Um, they're comparable to wild population estimates within the Chesapeake Bay, as well as those previously estimated um, within the Delaware Bay. Um, does that mean they're doing well? Does it mean that they're healthy? Are they big enough? Um, typically for marine invertebrates, they tend to have really small affected population sizes relative to their abundances. Um, oftentimes it can be a really small fraction, about 10 to the minus six. So in terms of numbers that are targets in conservation biology, it can be hard to put these into context. And so what I wanted to do was look outside the bay and see if there was anything else I could compare these estimates to to help put them into context. And so fortunately, a recent study on population genetics of Canadian oysters recently came out, and I was able to use their genomic data set to calculate effective population sizes for those populations and compare it to the, the estimates within the Bay. And so the first thing that you'll notice is that um, the Chesapeake Bay effective population sizes are consistently in order of magnitude smaller than those from Canada, um, except for this one population, COC, um, they're an order of magnitude higher than those in the Chesapeake Bay. And so these differences are really quite substantial. And so um, does this have to do with differences in disease history and differences in harvest history? Um, it's not totally clear, um, but it appears that the Canadian oysters are in better shape. And according to that review uh, the, by Beck et al, um, it was suggested that Canadian oyster populations are characterized as fair compared to those within the Chesapeake Bay that are characterized as poor. And so therefore, these comparisons between restored and contemporary wild reefs in overlook the potentially large differences between present and historical diversity, so these shifting baselines. And so if these estimates of effective population size in Canadian populations are accurate and are reflective of these reduced anthropogenic impacts over time, then the effective population size of the Chesapeake Bay oyster populations are still much reduced to what they were in, in the past. And so um, therefore maintaining diversity of um, Chesapeake Bay wild populations should really only be a minimum target. Um, and so switching gears a little bit, um, one of the things that you can do with these revert, reduced representation library methods, um, this genome-wide data set, is um, scan the genome of individuals and look for signals of selection. So um, you're identifying loci or regions of the genome that may be involved in local adaptation. And so um, local adaptation has implications for broodstock selection. And so there are a number of different methods that you can use to um, detect uh, potential 
regions or loci under selection. Um, but I'm just going to go through one of them that I use called genotype environment associations. And so in particular, this method can allow uh, to can tell us what the potential environmental drivers are of selection and local adaptation. And so the method that I used is called a redundancy analysis. And the environmental variables that I used were salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and pH. And so these uh, environmental variables were taken from buoys that were closest to the sampling sites uh, for oysters. And so I did this redundancy analysis to look for putatively adaptive loci um, using my full data set, so all populations as well as um, those just within the bay to look at selection within the bay. So this is excluding that uh, coastal bay watcher pre example. Um, and I don't have time to go through all of the results today, but feel free to ask questions if you have any. Um, but one thing that you'll notice is that salinity is really important for um, all populations as well as just including the inner bay populations. And so, um, what you can do, um, I have a genome, and so um, like I said, it's really great for this type of work. I can use the genome, um, look at the oyster genome, where the specific SNP is in the genome, and then I can see if it's within a gene, um, and if it is, then I can look at what that function, that gene's function is, and that will tell me what the potential target of selection is. And so just to show you a couple results, these are examples of gene functions. And so on the left is the chromosome that that gene occurs on. So there's 10 chromosomes in the oyster genome. And then below uh, are the gene functions. And so what you can see is that the, those that are highlighted in purple, um, those are involved in ion binding and osmotic activities. And so essentially this is aiding in the ability of oysters to conform to their environment. So this makes sense given that this was um, associated with salinity. Um, and then the last three that I have circled here, um, these have been shown to respond to salinity in gene expression studies. And so this is encouraging that their functions make sense um, and they've been, been seen uh, to respond to salinity in previous studies. And so this suggests that they are uh, real outliers. These are putatively adaptive uh, SNPs. And so moving forward, this provides insights into the mechanisms of salinity adaptation in oysters. And so just to briefly touch on um, something else to do with these results, um, what I'm showing you here is a genome picture of local adaptation. And so this is really the cutting edge of what people are doing now. And um, this is called a Manhattan plot because the peaks represent skyline of the city. And so the x-axis here is showing you the relative position of each SNP. The dots represent SNPs. And then on the y-axis is showing you the relative significance of that SNP. Um, and what you'll notice here is that most of these significant um, genes uh, associated with salinity were on chromosome five and six. Um, but there were also a lot of significant uh, SNPs associated with salinity um, across the genome, which is suggested of locally adapted variation being pervasive throughout many genomic regions. And so just to wrap it up, um, it is clear that the use of large broodstock numbers from multiple local sites and the planting of multiple cohorts over many planting seasons will increase diversity at restored sites, um, especially when broodstock numbers are low. And so these uh, recommendations may offer a straightforward way to achieve increases in abundances while also um, promoting uh, self-sustaining wild populations. And so the genomic analyses uh, suggest local adaptation in Chesapeake Bay oyster populations. And so it was revealed that salinity was correlated with um, SNPs that were putatively under selection. And uh, like I've said, local adaptation has implications for broodstock selection. So um, these results suggest that wild broodstock from large local populations that are experiencing similar environments to candidate sites is likely to provide the most appropriate sources for hatchery-based restoration of oysters in the Chesapeake Bay.
And so with that, I would like to acknowledge my uh, co-author and advisor, Lewis Plough, as well as my committee members, um, everyone that helped me sample these wild oysters, um, as well as my um, funding sources, Sea Grant and the Deerbrook Charitable Trust. And I have my email there, as well as my Twitter handle, if you wanna reach out um, and have any questions, but I can take any questions now as well. Great, thank you so much, Katie. Okay, we do have a few questions. The first one is, are there other factors or variables that affect effective population size besides genetic diversity? Were these accounted for in this study? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, so the main things that, uh, that are, were not accounted for in particular is um, that affect effective population size. Um, sex ratio, for example, impacts uh, effective population size. Um, fluctuating population size as well does not um, affect effective population size. Um, as well as, um, but they're all, you know, related to genetic diversity. And um, in particular, this parameter is notoriously difficult to estimate um, due to the number of caveats associated with estimating it. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of the things affecting effective population size, there are, are many. Um, I just named a few. And then if they were accounted for in my estimates, um, I, I used a um, genetic-based estimate specifically. So there's genetic-based estimates as well as demographic-based estimates. Um, and so uh, the genetic-based estimates can, uh, they have specific correction factors to take into account overlapping generations, for example. That answers the question, the complicated one. All right, thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. Our next question, um, uh, restoration budgets, I mean, projects are budget limited. So does your research provide any indications about how many more broodstock or how many more plantings, which affect the costs, the number of tanks, the size of the staff are needed to significantly improve chances of success of the project? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, based on my results, I can't give a specific number, um, but I can say, for example, is um, if you don't have, if broodstock numbers are small, then um, planting reefs with um, hatchery produced oysters many times will perhaps lead to the maintenance of diversity. Um, and that can, you know, that's less time or less uh, space within the hatchery for large broodstock numbers. Um, but this isn't really, I can't, I don't know if I could like get a specific number from this work, rather specific protocols to follow and recommendations to follow. Great, thank you. Our next question. How do you know that Harris Creek wild sample wasn't the offspring of the hatchery reared oysters? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, so based on the age class of the oysters, so uh, planting started in 2010, and so these oysters were uh, over six years old based on a, a length of age estimate, um, as well as um, the hatchery oysters tend to grow in these clumps. So the way the age of the oysters as well as um, the uh, shape of the oysters was how we determined them to be uh, wild oysters from Harris Creek. Great, thank you. Next question. Does broodstock selection targeting local adaptation ultimately result in loss of diversity? Yeah. Um, I think I think I know what the person is saying. Um, it, like, so if you are using locally adapted brood stock, it will lead to decreases in diversity. Um, no, but uh, for example, if like some of the things that I talked about at the beginning, if there aren't a lot of individuals that um, to use for brood stock locally, 
then that could be a problem. So then you'd have, you'd be using a small number of broodstock, producing offspring from a small number of broodstock and perhaps decreasing genetic diversity. Um, so then, you know, if, if you do find that your populations are locally adapted, then um, using uh, broodstock from a site that has similar environmental parameters, assuming that there's some specific parameter driving that local adaptation um, would be the best source, um, if I understood that question correctly. I think you did, and we do have uh, two questions that are closely piggybacking off of that sentiment. Uh, the first is, how do you balance genetic diversity versus local adaptation? That's a fantastic question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, I feel like that person should email me because it's going to take a lot longer than a couple minutes to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I can pass that on to you. Uh, next question. How different are the environmental parameters among the sample sites? For example, what is the range in average uh, selenians driving local adaptation? Um, I don't know those off the top of my head. And if that person wants to email me, I can give them an exact number. Um, but they actually were quite different. Um, for example, in the, I can just show in the map, um, might be easier. So for example, this site here, these upper sites actually had um, a different salinity uh, than this site by a couple parts per thousand. And so um, in terms of the average, so the differences actually are are a lot more than I had thought initially. Um, and then, sp especially this coastal bay site, the salinity is is quite different than these these Harris Creek sites as well as this Chop Tank River site. So, great, thank you. Our last question, kind of hopping back into the diversity, is there enough genetic diversity left? at Chesapeake Bay sites to use only broodstock gathered from each site? Or should restoration projects consider augmenting a site's gene pool with broodstock from other sites to increase genetic diversity and chances of survival, reproductive success? Yeah, um, that's a good question. And I think based on uh, the results that I've presented here, um, it's clear that the Chesapeake Bay does have a lot of broodstock. Um, when you compare the Chesapeake Bay to say, for example, uh, oysters in New York, where they're really, really broodstock limited, um, I think there is enough broodstock within the Chesapeake Bay. And you can see by these increases in diversity by um, planting reefs multiple times with hatchery produced oysters. And so, um, yeah, I think based on my data, I would say that there is enough um, broodstock within the Chesapeake Bay and that because there is this uh, really strong uh, local adaptation related to salinity that, um, you know, using broodstock that are in these similar environments is really the best source. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple questions coming in and we only have a couple minutes left, so I'm gonna grab one of them. Are there implications to aquaculture or because they are a crop, no connection? Uh, implications with this work to aquaculture? Uh, I mean, not particularly because the, I mean, the only implication is that you're growing these oysters in a, in a hatchery like you would for aquaculture, but the goal of this is restoration and the goal of this is um, increasing uh, wild populations. So, um, but the connection in terms of like, you know, genetic impacts with aquaculture is, is there is that connection and that's a whole different um, issue. Great, thanks, Katie. Can you uh, go back to your last slide with your email so everyone can see yes, that sorry. before we sign off? And we do have one question that I am going to pass along uh, to you offline to answer. 
uh, because we have run out of time. Okay. Uh, with that, I'm going to thank everyone for joining us. I hope everyone has a, a lovely rest of their day. And thank you for uh, listening in. Bye, everyone.